All right, so today we're going to be talking about neurophysiology and myophysiology. Um, and here are my details if you want to get in contact, ask me any questions um, about neuro, um, phys, or anything in general. Um, and hopefully you guys have access to these slides. So today we're going to be talking about motor systems, sensory systems, neural connections, the ANS, as well as pain. Um, and in terms of how important this stuff actually is, um, it made up 20% of our paper one last year. So I'd say it's quite important, um, but also clinically, so moving on, um, I guess, for the rest of your careers. Uh, it's really important to understand concepts like local anaesthetics. Um, it really comes in handy next year for anatomy. Um, and a lot of pathologies have to do with um, the nervous system. Um, and some resources I'd really recommend looking at are um, Guyton Hall Physiology Review. So their questions. Um, so whenever you see review at the end of a um, textbook, it just means questions. Um, rapid Review Physiology is a really great summary. And of course, always PSPs are really helpful. So let's just start about the, um, the nervous system in general. Um, so the way it's split up is central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, and then peripheral is everything else. Within peripheral, there's somatic, um, which is, I guess, like the voluntary and autonomic involuntary, although those definitions aren't perfect. Um, and then within somatic, you have afferent fibres, so sensory, motor, efferent, and then within autonomic, sympathetic, um, so um, running away from a tiger, and then parasympathetic, um, relaxing. Um, so we're going to start off by talking about motor neurons, and they can be a little bit hard to understand initially, but just to simplify it, upper motor neurons are the ones that will start in the brain, usually in the cortex, and then they go to the spinal cord to synapse with the lower motor neurons, which directly innervate the muscle. And you might see lower motor neurons referred to as alpha motor neurons. So just know that they're the same thing. Um, and some more terminology, um, a motor unit is the one um, lower motor neuron with the muscle fibers it innervates. So that won't be a whole muscle. Um, whereas the motor neuron pool is the whole muscle with all of the lower motor neurons that innervate it. And also, if you have any questions at any time, feel free to um, just unmute yourself um, and call out or pop it in the chat. Um, so in terms of the central nervous system, um, so you don't really know um, the brain in too much detail for your first year, but just some important parts that I think you should be aware of are the primary motor cortex, and that's involved in all motor functions. Um, it's important to understand that the that it's contralateral, the organisation. So the left part of the brain um, sends and receives signals from the right side of the body. And also that the amount of space in the cortex dedicated to a body part is based on um, its sensitivity. So this is um, a little version of the homunculus map, which basically so shows that um, areas like the face and the hand um, are quite sensitive. So they have a large amount of cortical space Whereas something like the arm, less so, so there's less space in the cortex dedicated to the arm. Um, the premotor cortex is involved in planning actions. The um, somatosensory cortex, kind of as the name implies, um, is for sensory information. Um, the parietal association cortex for spatial awareness. Um, and the cerebellum um, is for balance and coordination. And it does that by modifying the signals going down the spinal cord from the brain. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about muscles. Um, so I think firstly, it's important to understand how muscles are actually laid out. Um, so the important histological features that actually come up on exams quite regularly, um, that they have many peripheral nuclei and they're also striated. In terms of the composition um, related to its connective tissue, so the whole muscle is wrapped in epimycin, um, whereas a group of muscle cells, also called a fascicle, is wrapped in perimycin, which you can see here, and then the myocytes are wrapped in endomycin. And then within the myocytes, you have your sarcolemma, 
which you can see here, which is um, just another word for cell membrane, but specifically for a myocyte. And that has T tubules extending down. And then the myofibrils um, contain your actin myosin um, and then your sarcoplasmic reticulum is super important because it stores calcium. Um, so in terms of excitation um, contraction coupling, excitation just means the stimulation um, by a neuron. So the action potential going down um, that alpha neuron towards the neuromuscular junction that we can see here. And then the contraction is when actin and myosin um, interact together to pull the Z lines closer to the end line, um, which we will go into much more detail um, in the next slide. Um, so this looks a little bit complicated, but I think that it's important to understand and I'm trying to simplify it as much as possible. So um, here we're talking about the muscle contraction from excitation um, to relaxation. So the first step is the action potential uh, needs to travel down the motor neuron and then acetylcholine, so our important um, neurotransmitter for muscle contraction, um, is released into the neuromuscular junction um, and the neurotransmitter will bind to nicotinic receptors. Um, and the importance of them is that they're ligand-gated sodium channels. So ligand-gated means that they open in response to acetylcholine rather than your voltage-gated channels, which respond um, to depolarization. So because the acetylcholine has bound to our ligand-gated receptors, um, they open and sodium um, enters into the cell. And then when sodium enters, um, we gradually depolarize until we reach the threshold in which the voltage-gated so sodium channels um, will open. The action potential then will move down um, the T-tubules. So if you remember there, an extension of the sarcolemma. Um, and then I think these next two steps are probably the most complicated to understand. Um, but I've got a good diagram on the next slide. So you have your dehydropyridine receptors, um, or just DHP. They're voltage-gated sodium channels. So um, they will respond to the depolarization to open to release calcium. Um, but they are actually connected to the riodine receptors. Um, and these ones open mechanically rather through the depolarization. So once the DHP receptors open, then they will mechanically open the ryanodine receptors. And this releases the calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Then we have our cross bridge cycling, which we'll go into more detail soon, um, which will be our actual contraction. And then um, our final step is for relaxation. We need to pump the calcium ions back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum to uh, maintain that concentration gradient so that we can have another contraction. Um, and so because you're pumping against the concentration gradient, you need to use ATP. So the enzyme responsible is a calcium ATPase. Here's some um, nice diagrams. So first of all, um, this diagram shows the acetylcholine binding um, and you can see the ligand um, gated receptor here opening up to allow the sodium in, in response. And then um, over here, we can see the DHP receptor with the ryanodine receptor um, and the DHP opening, which opens the ryanodine, which allows the calcium to flow out from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, um, and because clinical applications always help us understand things, um, the important one here is myasthenia gravis, um, where you have an autoimmune destruction of the acetylcholine receptors. So the immune system basically attacks these receptors and so patients with this disease will have um, many less acetylcholine receptors. Um, so there's impaired um, transduction at the neuromuscular junction, so they can't contract their muscles very well, which means the features of muscle weakness um, and fatigue, amongst other things. Um, and then I think the treatment really helps you understand um, the situation as well, because if you remember acetylcholinesterases, are the enzymes which take away acetylcholine from the neuromuscular junction. So you can treat this disease by um, 
by um, anti-acetylcholine esterases. So you're basically getting rid of the enzymes which clear acetylcholine. So if we have more acetylcholine, even though we have less receptors, um, there'll be a better chance of contraction. Okay, um, cross-bridge cycling. Um, so we have our thick and thin filaments, actin and myosin. Um, myosin we can see here and actin here. Um, troponin also is pretty important. So that's going to be um, bound to tropomyosin. Um, and we have three different times. So TNT um, binds directly to the tropomyosin. And then the TNI and TNC binding to calcium and actin. And um, we've had, we have a good diagram of tropomyosin on the next slide. And then the final thing um, that is a little bit relevant, but it also just comes up in diagrams, so it's good to understand what it is. Um, Titan, we can see here, is important for um, providing muscle elasticity at rest. Um, in terms of all these lines and zones and bands, I don't think it's so important to know all of them. But the main ones I'd suggest um, being super familiar with are the Z discs and the M line, because with contractions, we're bringing um, the Z discs towards the M line. Um, so in terms of the actual steps, um, so initially we have myosin, which is energized or cocked. Um, and that's because in the last step of the previous cycle, it split ATP, um, and so it has energy from ATP. However, the um, tropomyosin, which we can see here, is this um, long rope-like thing with the troponin complexes on it, is actually um, covering the actin site. So we need calcium to bind. Remember, calcium came um, from the sarcoplasmic reticulum after the action potential moved down into the muscle cell. Um, so when we get that calcium, it will bind to the troponin um, and due to a conformational change, the tropomyosin will actually move and the actin site will now be exposed, which means myosin can bind to actin. And then the actual contraction happens when the myosin, which has its cocked head, rotates and um, brings the actin um, and the Z disc closer together, so closer to the M line, which is the middle. And that's when you have your um, ADP and phosphate released. And once that's released, that site is now available, so the ATP will bind. And that is very crucial to actually break the active myosin linkage so that you can relax. And then the final step to get ready for the next contraction um, is the ATP needs to be split. Um, and by using that energy, the my myosin head is re So we're basically back to step one. And that's how it becomes a cycle. Um, and this is a nice diagram of basically what I just said. But I think it's, um, it really helps to be able to actually see the interactions. Um, and another clinical application, um, I think you might have talked about it a bit this year, is rigor mortis. Um, and that it basically um, refers to the stiffening of the body after death. And the reason why you get that is because um, you need ATP, um, as we could see in, um, what was it, step five, in order to break the actin and myosin linkage. So after death, when you're no longer undergoing metabolism, you're not producing ATP. And so your actin and myosin won't be able to um, break up. Um, and so it will create this stiffness. Um, in terms of types of muscle contractions, um, not super high yield, but just good to get your head around. So isotonic is when um, the muscle is actually changing length. So say if you're doing a bicep curl, whereas isometric is when it's not changing length at all. So if you're pulling really hard on a rope or pushing on a wall, um, and so to understand that, it's basically that the cross bridge cycling is still occurring, but the cross bridges, rather than the Z lines coming together, they actually just keep rebu rebuilding in the same place, um, but you're still creating tension. Um, concentric is muscle shortening, um, so like the first half of a bicep curl, and then eccentric, the second half, when your biceps lengthen. Um, summation and tetanus, uh, I think, is a bit of a trickier concept. So summation 
is basically when you have lots of muscle twitches um, kind of close together. Um, and then tetanus is when you have these at high enough frequency and close together that you produce a smooth muscle contraction. Um, another important concept um, with the crossbridge cycling is the length tension relationships. So we can see here that our normal range is um, pretty optimal. But when um, you have a lot of overlap between the um, actin filaments, as we can see here, if you were to um, have your linkage between actin and myosin and try and bring them closer to the Z lines, you're not going to get very far. So the amount of tension you can produce is um, quite unremarkable. We can see it's almost zero. Whereas here, when there's just a little overlap, um, we will be able to get the Z lines quite close together, um, but still not amazing. And then here we can see um, optimally all of our myosin heads can bind to an actin. So they're all going to be able to be used. Um, but and we can bring the Z lines close together. Um, we can see in number three, not all of the myosin heads um, will be able to bind. We can see these two um, are just not going to be doing anything. Um, so nothing too remarkable will happen. And here again, nothing's really going to happen because we've just got one um, myosin head able to bind. Um, so in terms of force generation, this is um, another little um, concept to understand. So the main thing here is that you will always recruit your small motor units first. Um, and if you remember, the motor unit um, was the one alpha motor neuron with the muscle fibres um, that it innervates. Um, and these are very fatigue resistant because they're kind of always being um, recruited. Whereas the large motor units, um, they innervate lots of muscle fibres. So the one alpha motor neuron with lots of muscle fibres and they fatigue really easily. So they're recruited last. So we can see here on this diagram, if we were going from walking to sprinting, over here, the force production for walking would be quite low. So we're um, utilizing those small motor units. Whereas when we're going um, to sprinting, we need the high motor units, um, the large motor units, which will produce a lot of um, force. Okay, so our first set of questions. Um, question one, tetanic contraction of skeletal muscle fibers results from a cumulative increase in the intracellular concentration of ATP, calcium, potassium, or sodium. Feel free to pop it in the chat or you can either message me privately or yell out, um, just have a go. All right, so hopefully you all said calcium um, because we need the calcium to come out of the sarcoplasm reticulum, bind to our troponin C, move the tropomyosin so our actin and myosin combined. Okay. Um, weightlifting can result in a dramatic increase in skeletal muscle mass and this increase is primarily attributable to which of the following? So we've got fusion of sarcomeres, hypertrophy of an individual muscle fibre, um, increase in skeletal muscle blood supply or increase in the number of motor neurons. Have a go, put an answer in the chat. It's okay if you get it wrong. Yeah, awesome job, Alex. Um, so hypertrophy of individual muscle fibers. Um, okay, now we're gonna move on to sensory systems. Um, so for sensory processing, um, there's some important concepts um, and definitions to get your head around before we start. So sensation includes um, both conscious and unconscious detection of um, stimuli. So that includes perception, which is the conscious subset. So perception would be like feeling um, like the warm fire 
whereas um, the unconscious sub, um, subset would be if your blood pressure increased, um, you wouldn't really be able to tell. Um, in terms of your receptors, so you have your sense organs, so things like your eyes, um, which contain the nerve endings. And then you have your important transducers, which convert the stimulus, so let's say light, into the um, electrochemical energy, which will be your action potential running along your neuron. And the fibres um, important here are the A beta fibres, um, which is important to know what fibres do what. Um, and we've got a diagram coming up soon about um, distinguishing the fibres from each other. Um, in terms of how you actually interpret the information, so the modality, so what type of information we're talking about um, is determined by what pathway it came from um, when it went to the brain. Location, um, so that's related to the receptive field. So I'm not sure if you um, did this in your lectures, but this is um, two-point discrimination. So we can see if this is the one receptive field, if it feels... Um, a stimulus so we can see there's two stimulus here but the brain will perceive it as one point because it's within one receptive field whereas if it's kind of within two we'll feel two points here so as you can imagine small receptive fields um, you'll be able to detect these two points where the large receptive fields you're less likely to so an example would be if you um, like close your eyes and put two pins on your finger you would probably be able to feel that there's two because um, your receptive fields are quite small in your hands. Whereas if you did it on your heel, you might only be able to feel one. In terms of the intensity, that's related to the frequency of the action potentials, as well as um, the number of motor neurons firing. Oh, sorry, not motor neurons, afferent neurons. And then the duration. Um, these two concepts are quite important. So we have phasic, which adapt very rapidly. Um, and so an example of that would be if you walk into a room and it has a funny smell um, and like when you walk in, you're like, oh, this is disgusting. Um, but then after a while, you can't smell it at all. Um, whereas tonic firing adapts very slowly. So as long as the stimulus is there, um, you'll have action potentials being sent. Um, so examples of that is something like sight. Um, so just the receptors involved, not going to go through all of these, it's pretty self-explanatory, but um, chemoreceptors, mechanoreceptors, photoreceptors, thermoreceptors, nociceptors, and proprioceptors, and their function is really just in their name. Um, okay, so now with mechanoreceptors, um, you do need to know the specifics of these, um, not in too much detail though. I'm going to start off with the most important one, which is the onion which we can see here on histology, and that's the Pacinian corpuscle. And that's probably the one that comes up in exams most often. Um, but as you can see, all of these receptors, um, they're classified as slow acting or fast acting and small receptive field or large receptive field. So in terms of receptive fields, that's what we talked about before. Um, here. So smaller receptive fields will be able to um, detect more precisely um, the stimulus, whereas large receptive fields less precise, and slow acting versus fast acting. So that's just the rate at which it will generate um, its action potential. Um, so just the important um, buzzwords, I suppose. So as I said, the onions, most important, the sinian corpuscle. Um, and because it's a large receptive field, it won't be for very specific things, um, but more for, um, for textures. Um, the mice's corpuscle, another kind of buzzwordy thing, um, that's for slip and grip. So if you were like holding your phone and it slipped out of your hands, um, these would detect that. And as we can see, it's fast acting. There's like that reflex, like grab your phone. Um, and then the raffinis is skin stretch. Um, so I don't know if you like stretching your hair like that. Um, and then the miracles is for um, shape and texture. And I wouldn't really um, memorize where they are too much. Um, just kind of the things I put in bold and this onion is super important. Okay, proprioception. Um, so here we've got our intrafusal and extrafusal fibers. 
Um, so our intrafusal fibres, we can see are um, these ones, which are parallel to our extrafusal fibres, um, and they detect stretch. Um, and so when they're stretched, they will fire off um, some sensory neurons and tell um, your brain that, okay, like this hamstring stretch is a little too strong. Say if you're trying to do the splits or something like that. And that's really important to prevent you from tearing your muscle um, or overstretching. The extra fusal ones are just the body of the muscle and they're the ones that contract um, to shorten the muscle. Um, and then the Golgi tendon organs are um, here. So within the tendon, uh, we can see it here. And then this is like the zoomed in version. Um, and they are actually perpendicular to the extra fusal. Um, and they are important for signaling tension. So if the ch tension is changing too quickly, um, it will um, tell your brain to stop what you're doing. Um, so that will also prevent tearing of the muscle. Okay, more questions um, and please put in your chat um, your answers. So which of the following is a receptor found deep in the skin, which detects indentation of the skin and vibration? All right, awesome, Alex, absolutely killing it. Um, Pacinian corpuscle, absolutely right. Um, that will most likely be the answer in most of your multiple choice questions because I think it's the one that comes up the most. So if you're ever in doubt, pick the onion. Um, okay, within the primary somatosensory cortex, the various parts of the contralateral body surface are represented in areas of varying size, which reflects which of the following. So basically what this is saying is the homunculus map, like what's the deal with that? Um, so A, the relative size of the body parts, B, the density of the specialized peripheral receptors, C, the size of the muscles in that body part, or D, the conduction velocity of the primary afferent fibers. Yeah, good job guys. Um, B is perfect. So I just chucked that map in again. Um, just to remind you, it has nothing to do with the size of the body parts, but just how well they are, um, how many receptors they are. Okay, neural integration um, is probably the most abstract thing um, of neurophys in year one. Um, so from having a goal to actually doing something. So if I wanna like pick up my drink bottle, this is what's going to happen. My premotor cortex um, will help with actually making that goal. So I'm thirsty. I want to pick up my drink bottle. Um, and then if I've done this before, so I, I have a memory of doing this, I know what to do. The supplementary motor cortex will help me plan how I'm actually going to do it. And then we need our upper motor neuron to um, start this um, impulse generation. And that starts the primary motor cortex. The initiation of the movement is going to come from the basal ganglia and you might remember the indirect and direct pathways associated with the basal ganglia and we're going to go into more detail with that very soon. The thalamus loves to be excited um, and so that's actually what's going to help excite the movement um, and then the movement of course is going to come from the muscles so this is our um, lower motor neurons now. And then, as I said before, with the cerebellum, it kind of comes in last and it modifies um, the movements or the descending tract, um, also called modulates, and that helps with coordination um, so that you don't just have random muscle twitches, but it actually happens like um, in a nice coordinated fashion. Um, okay, so the basal ganglia pathways are a collection of nuclei. Um, which just means a cluster of neurons. Got a little diagram here, so they kind of sit here. Um, but don't worry too much about anatomy yet. Um, that will come up in second year. And we have two main pathways to know about, the direct and the indirect. So the direct is the one that causes muscle contraction and indirect is the one that inhibits it. Um, so that's obviously really important to prevent unwanted movements. Um, so this was me trying to um, make a good diagram because I couldn't find any. So just to orientate everyone, 
um, we can see that the direct and the indirect, the, basically out, the basic outline is the same, and the indirect, we've just got this extra part here. Um, red is the inhibition, um, and that's via the neurotransmitter GABA. Um, green, excitatory from glutamate, because you remember glutamate is your mate, and your mate gets you excited. Um, the other important thing to understand is um, which part of this pathway is tonic. And hopefully you remember from before, tonic means it's um, always firing. So this is kind of what will be happening if nothing else is happening. So if we start with the direct pathway, the goal is to excite a muscle. So we're going to start off in the cortex. Um, and so the cortex will um, excite the striatum. So part of the basal ganglia. And then by exciting the striatum, it can do its function to inhibit the globus pallidus and substantia nigra. So if we've inhibited this, then we've inhibited the inhibitor. That's a bit of a weird thing to say, I know. Um, that's definitely the way to understand it. So the globus pallidus and substantia nigra is always the thing inhibiting the thalamus and that's what we have at rest. So if we've knocked this out, we can no longer inhibit the thalamus. And so if you can't inhibit the thalamus, remember I said the thalamus loves to be excited. So it'll be excited, it will um, excite the cortex. And then hopefully you remember the cortex um, is the start of the upper motor neurons. So it'll send the upper motor neurons, lower motor neurons down to the muscle so we can have contraction. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, definitely you might need to spend a couple um, of minutes like trying to say that loud, try to explain it to yourself um, and hopefully it'll click. But the key word here is you're inhibiting the inhibitor. Okay, now with the direct pathway, sorry, the indirect. So we want to prevent muscle contraction. So we can see around the outside um, that just looks the same as the direct pathway, but the indirect is going to be this extra little bit. So the cortex exciting the striatum, which now inhibits the globus pallidus. So if the globus pallidus is inhibited, it can't inhibit this subthalamic nucleus. So subthalamic nucleus is just free to do its job because its inhibitor has been knocked out. So if it's free to do its job, it's going to stimulate this globus pallidus and substantia nigra, which inhibits the thalamus, and then nothing can happen because the cortex can't be excited. Um, I really hope that makes sense, guys. <laughs> I know it's a little bit complicated, and also the words um, are a little bit complicated, um, which I just think adds to the complexity. Um, but try and draw it out um, and try and explain it to yourself. Okay, now the autonomic nervous system. So what actually is it? It is the unconsciously directed um, things that your body can do. So digestion, um, sweating, things like that. Um, and even though it's part of the peripheral nervous system, it's actually controlled by the central nervous system. So the buzzword here is the hypothalamus is the boss. Um, however, there are some other important parts of the brain that help. Um, so uh, one to know is the nucleus tractus solitarius, which is important for cardiorespiratory changes. So things like blood pressure. Um, some functions are um, reflexes though, so you won't actually go up to the brain, um, but will just reach the spinal cord. Um, and a good example of that is um, babies before they're toilet trained will just urinate whenever they need to. And that's because urination is actually a reflex, um, which can just happen by going to the spinal cord and then back to the bladder. However, once you are toilet trained, um, the um, afferent fibres that are sensing that the blood is full will go up to the brain and the um, brain, I guess, will modulate um, or take over like the conscious um, ability to hold on if it's not appropriate. So that just kind of shows how um, you can have just a spinal cord reflex, but also the brain will always be the boss that can overpower things. And some other things that can also happen just at um, the spinal cord level are defecation, erection and ejaculation. Um, okay, structure. I think this is um, a really great place to start. Um, so in terms of myelination with your autonomic nerves, um, always the preganglionic nerves are myelinated. 
And hopefully you remember that myelin is the um, insulating sheath that just allows nerve impulses to go really fast. Um, and so we can see with our autonomic nerves, they all have ganglions as opposed to our somatic nerves, which just travel, travel um, straight to the skeletal muscle. And so that's basically where they synapse. Um, and then there's the postganglionic nerve. Um, in terms of neurotransmitters, we can see that acetylcholine is always a neurotransmitter in the preganglionic nerve, so the nerve before the ganglia. So that's easy to remember. However, in the postganglionic nerve, in the sympathetic division, it's um, noradrenaline or norepinephrine if you're American, um, and then acetylcholine in parasympathetic. And I think that's not too hard to remember because adrenaline, we think sympathetic, parasympathetic, just the other one. Um, in terms of acetylcholine, we talked about the nicotinic receptors before. So that's for mainly our, um, our skeletal muscle, um, whereas the muscarinic is for our autonomic um, nervous system. Um, so things such as smooth muscle, like in our gut or our cardiac muscle. Um, in terms of the specific muscarinic receptors, there's M1, M2, M3. M3 is the main one you need to know. Um, noradrenaline, there are a lot more receptors. Um, so we have alpha 1 and alpha 2. And with the alphas, um, if you just think alpha is usually involved in constriction responses, you get 90% of the questions right. Beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, um, then is the dilation responses. Um, and with beta 1, we have one heart, so it um, is involved in the heart. Beta 2, we have two lungs, that's so involved in the lungs. And then beta 3, the other one, is involved in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, this is really more of the same. I think these diagrams are really great. Okay, parasympathetic. Um, so this comes from the cranial sacral portion. So we can see cranial meaning brain. So usually the cranial nerves um, and the sacrum. And how I remember this is when you're resting, you're sitting on your bum and you're thinking. So bum, cranium, thinking, sorry, bum, sacrum, cranium, thinking. And they synapse really close to the target organ. Um, so they're synapsing here. Whereas the sympathetic synapsing much further away. And the way I remember that is, you know, you're not in a rush. So um, like you're relaxing, you're going to sign up a bit later. Sympathetic, on the other hand, come from the thoracic and lumbar regions. And something that's not really explained um, in year one, that's really important for year two and just general understanding is what this big thing is. Um, and that's called the sympathetic trunk. And basically the purpose of that is if we're only having fibres coming from the thoracic and lumbar regions, and we need to get them all the way, say, to the eye. We need an escalator to go up and down the body. So we can see, um, if we look at the eye, we've got our fibres um, coming from, like, it looks like maybe T1 to T4, something like that. Mm. And they move up the escalator and then they um, synapse before they leave. We can see most of them synapse before they leave or some um, synapse at these more specific ganglia. Um, so I hope that whole concept of the escalator makes a bit of sense. It's not super important to know in year one, but just for a bit of context and very important for later years. Um, this is probably the most important thing for you guys, for autonomic nerves, um, what they actually do. And hopefully it's just a bit of um, like logic and common sense. Um, so I think that the eyes are probably the hardest um, slash the least common sense response. So parasympathetic, um, you undergo pupil constriction, also known as meiosis, not to be confused with cell division of gametes. Um, and all of our parasympathetic responses that we can see is by the M3. It's like the main ones that you need to know. So that's nice and easy. Whereas sympathetic, um, you need to see really well, so dilation of the pupils. Um, as well as increase in aqueous humor production. And that's just basically um, a liquid produced by the eyes. Um, and that's via alpha one and beta two. And you're probably thinking like, well, Piper said that alpha is constriction, but this is dilation. Um, and it's because you're actually constricting the dilator muscle, um, which is a bit confusing. Um, so I guess that's just a bit of an exception to the rule. 
Um, in terms of heart rate, that's just a bit logical. Sympathetic, you're going to increase it. Parasympathetic, reduce it. And as I said, you've got one heart, so if I beta one, lungs, um, you're going to need bronchodilation. So um, that will dilate the um, bronchi to increase the amount of air you can get into your lungs, which is important when you're running away from the scary animal. And we have two lungs, so beta two. Um, the other um, bronchoconstriction for parasympathetic blood vessels. Interestingly, um, you can only really vasoconstrict um, via sympathetic and then to vasodilate, it's not really parasympathetic action. It's more the absence of sympathetic, which um, is an important concept to understand that it's usually just, um, it's sort of a yin and yang situation. So just parasympathetic or sympathetic rather than, than them like competing with each other. So if sympathetic is on, parasympathetic will probably be off. So if we want to um, vasodilate our blood vessels, sympathetic will just be switched off rather than parasympathetic on. Um, so in terms of our gastrointestinal tract, so peristalsis is the smooth muscle contra um, contraction of the gut. So when we're resting, that's the perfect time to be digesting and getting the, um, the food through the GIT. So we'll be increasing that. Whereas if, when we're um, in high stress situation, we don't want to be wasting energy on that. So the motility is reduced. Um, bladder, also a bit logical. So um, we're gonna be emptying our bladder when we're relaxed, not when we're stressed. And then this is the weird anomaly, is the sweat glands are actually, um, so they're sympathetically innervated, but by um, our muscarinic receptors. Um, so that's just a bit of a, um, a random thing that um, I'm not sure if there's a very logical explanation for it, but just something to remember. Okay, question time. Um, this question is super important because it's a very common um, pathology, I guess. That's very important clinically. Um, so a 60-year-old man has a lung tumour that's compressing the sympathetic ganglia oops, you didn't say that, um, which contains sympathetic fibres to the head and neck. What symptoms would you expect to see? Um, and maybe because I might have given away the answer, if you can give me a little explanation, that would be awesome. All right, so it would be... Um, oh yeah, was someone going to explain it to me? Yeah, hey, Piper, I can try if you like. Yeah, go for it. Um, so you're blocking the sympathetic response. Yeah, as Alex said, you're blocking the sympathetic response, so the parasympathetic responses will dominate, which involves the contraction of the pupil. And because sweating is innervated by the sympathetic nervous system, if you're in decreasing the sympathetic response, you'll have decreased sweating. Yeah, perfectly done. Um, thank you so much, David and Alex. Um, okay, and what we really described here is something called Horner's syndrome. Okay, uh, last thing we're going to be talking about is the pain response. So, as promised, these are the different types of fibres, which hopefully you're familiar with. I remember that we weren't really taught so well about them, but it was kind of just assumed that we knew about them. So, um, we go from A um to see really um alpha beta gamma um and sorry delta and the myelination is decreasing and the diameter is also decreasing so if the myelination is decreasing then the speed of conduction um, will decrease as well okay so with nociception um, it's important to understand that the receptors for pain are actually just free nerve endings and when how pain is actually um, uh, how these receptors are actually stimulated is that once the cells are damaged algogenic substances which we will talk about more specifically later um, are produced and these act on the free nerve endings and when this happens um, the nerve endings are actually sensitized which is called hyperalgesia. Um, and we'll talk about that more specifically, but it basically means that you're um, more um, sensitive to pain. Uh, 
The important fibres here are the C fibres, so these ones with no myelin that have a small diameter. Um, and that's because with pain, you don't really need to know so specifically where it came from. If you just know that like your thumb's hurting, that's good enough. Um, and also the A delta fibres, um, which just have a little bit more myelination. Um, and it is tonic firing, um, which kind of makes sense. So if you um, keep the painful stimuli and then you're not going to have adaptation and you're going to keep on feeling pain. Um, and in terms of um, human evolution, that's obviously really important because when we feel pain, we want to get away from that painful stimuli. We don't want the pain to just go away. Okay, phase of no C-section, um, I would say that's quite important. You could definitely get a multiple choice on like just the order of the phases. Um, so definitely um, try and get this down pat. So first of all, we need to um, transduce the signal. So um, turn it into our action potential. Then we need to um, move it to the brain. So that's called transmission. And that's done by the spinothalamic pathway, which hopefully you remember from the SEM1. Um, but Basically, it'll come in from the spinal cord here and it decussates immediately at the spinal cord. So moves to the other side, goes all the way up um, to the thalamus and then to the somatosensory cortex, which we remember is for um, sensation. Then modulation um, is via the descending pathway. Um, and we'll talk about that soon, but basically we'll um, change how you perceive pain. And then the actual perception happens at the somatosensory cortex. Um, okay, types of pain. Um, this is probably more important for farm, um, but also good for fizz. Um, so fast pain is like the very sharp localised ones. So if you um, stick yourself with a needle. So um, less emotional overtones basically means it's not something like a headache or a stomach ache, which might be worse if you're stressed or something like that. Um, it's really just like, you know, you've got a needle in your finger. Um, and that's why opioids don't block this type of pain very well. It's actually covered, um, it's carried by the A-delta fibres. Um, so yeah, if you can imagine if you're taking something like codeine for a headache, you're still going to feel um, if you like cut yourself or something like that. Whereas slow pain is more of our dull, longer term pain, which could come from um, like a headache or if you've had surgery or something like that. Um, it's longer duration and there does seem to be some more emotional overtones, um, but it can also incorporate um, no perception of painful degrees of temperature. And this is carried by C fibres, which means opioids can work against this pain. So you might need to take an opioid for something like um, a toothache. Hopefully not, but you know, if it's really bad or a headache. Okay, algogenic substances. Um, so these are the ones to know. They're definitely a lot more um, than just these. Um, but histamine um, is really important during inflammation. So that actually activates the nociceptors. And you get histamine, histamine from the degranulation of mast cells. In terms of sensitization, um, prostaglandins, um, and leukotrienes come from arachidonic acid. And hopefully you guys remember this from um, studying NSAIDs, if you've done that yet. Um, so NSAIDs actually block this pathway to prevent the production of these substances. And what sensitization um, actually means, as I said before, it, um, it increases your ability to feel pain and that's by um, facilitating the opening of the sodium channels. So those action potentials um, or the transduction of pain can happen a lot faster. Substance P um, uh, doesn't really get talked about too much, but it's basically released from afferent nerves and it's also involved in sensitization. Um, okay, the transient receptor potential channels are a little bit oddly specific, but our pharmacology lecture um, wanted us to know them because um, they're found in Chile um, and they can be used to um, help with neuropathic pain and just a good application to kind of understand how nociceptors work. So basically these receptors are found on the nerve endings um, involved in nociception and they um, are gated ion channels so we can see here they allow the influx of um, sodium 
for the action potential to be initiated. Um, and it's found in hot chili, um, which I guess like if you have a lot of hot chili, it's really hot, but it can also be painful because it goes above that magic 43 degrees. And so by um, isolating this compound, it can be used pharmacologically um, by desensitization of these receptors or defunctionalization. Um, although the exact mode of action is not 100% known, um, but basically if you kill off these receptors, then you'll um, reduce um, your sensitization to pain. And specifically, it works really nicely for neuropathic pain. Um, so I know you don't, you haven't learned too much about these, um, but herpes, um, which can sit in your um, ganglia, can cause a lot of um, neuropathic pain or neuralgia. So it's really um, good um, to treat that kind of condition. Okay, thermoreception. Um, so I've touched on this a little bit so far, but this graph I think is nice because it just shows you that um, some temperatures you're just feeling cold. Whereas when you get really low, this coldness actually turns into pain. Some of you might have felt this if you go into an ice bath or something like that, it can actually start to hurt. And the same with heat. Um, I guess when you get closer to a fire, it goes from warmth to like, okay, this is actually hurting. Um, and that's just because the nose receptors start firing above that um, 43 degrees and below around 14 degrees. Um, okay, so just for a little bit more context um, on central sensitization with um, hyperalgesia. So this is quite normal, a quite normal response. And as I said before, it's driven by prostaglandins, which sensitize the nerve endings by um, increasing the ability for the sodium channels to open. So just the difference between primary and secondary is primary is just the injured area is hypersensitive, um, whereas the secondary response is when the surrounding area also becomes hypersensitive. Um, so you might have experienced that if you've like cut yourself and then afterwards if you touch um, over it and then maybe later even around it, it's a bit painful. And then allodynia um, is a bit of a separate thing and that's when you get pain from a non-painful stimulus. So this can be pathological um, due to damage to the nerves, which is seen in conditions like diabetes. But um, I'm sure most people have actually experiencing, um, experienced it if you have really sunburnt skin and you run it underwater and it actually feels painful. Um, so running it under cold water is a non-painful stimulus, um, but because it feels painful, it's called allodynia. Okay, another important concept, um, one of our last ones is referred pain. And that's when um, an organ, so a visceral structure, um, such as the heart, is inflamed. And that you don't feel it, say in the heart, you might feel it um, on the shoulder. And the reason for that is that the, our um, sensory neurons might be entering the spinal cord, let's just say C3. And then the brain isn't really used to feeling pain from your heart or your liver, um, but it's used to feeling pain on the shoulder. So it'll actually perceive this pain as cutaneous pain. Um, and this mechanism that I've explained, um, it's not, it might not be 100% true because the mechanism isn't 100% known, but um, this way of understanding is usually how um, our anatomy professors like us to understand it. So I think becoming familiar with this would be important. And an example, um, which is a, was a bit of a revelation for me, was what actually a stitch is when you're running, um, which you might have felt before. And it's basically because the liver is rubbing on the diaphragm. So the liver is in your right upper quadrant and your diaphragm innervated by C3 to C5. Um, so initially you might feel pain here, your right upper quadrant, um, but then because the diaphragm has this innervation, when it goes into the spinal cord, um, it, the um, pain will actually be perceived as the um, skin that's also innervated by C3 to C5, because as I said before, um, we're much more used to feeling pain um, cutaneously and hopefully you remember from your upper limb anatomy those dermatomes are like shoulder down the arm which is sometimes why you start to feel the stitch in your shoulder okay 
So second last concept, um, pain modulation. Um, so this was our second last step in the pain transduction um, five step process. And so it's basically the descending pathway, which can reduce um, the amount of pain that you're actually feeling. So this is um, a bit more important for farm, but I'm just gonna go over it a bit um, briefly. So in Keflin's are the important substance here and they're the opioids that our body makes, um, which act on the mu receptors. And so as we can see here, this is our descending neuron. This is our ascending neuron, um, first order, going to second order, and we have an interneuron. So we can see that the ascending, uh, sorry, the descending pathway is going um, to stimulate this interneuron, which will release um, the enkephalins um, that can act on the mu receptors to prevent um, this sensation of pain. So it's going to prevent the ascending pathway. And this is a really good explanation as to why sometimes things don't hurt as much, um, especially during a sports match when your adrenaline is really high. Um, and then the gate control theory of pain is, I guess, an application of this. But just to note that this is a theory, um, so it's not 100% proven. Um, but basically what the theory says is that rubbing a painful area, sorry for that typo, um, stimulates the um, A beta fibers. So you can see here, um, the Pacinian corpuscle, the onion, which I told you is really important. Um, so we're stimulating the dorsal, um, the DCML, um, which contains A beta fibers. And we can see that the painful stimulus going along the um, A delta and C fibers is going to the same place is the A beta fibers. So they're kind of competing. Um, but the A beta fibers, uh, I think that they're more important. Um, and so they actually prevent um, the ascending of the spinothalamic tract. So you um, won't feel as much pain. Okay, um, and just to finish off, um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, so pain receptors in the skin are typically classified as which of the following? Encapsulated nerve endings, um, a single class of morphologically specialised receptors, the same type of receptors that take position sense or free nerve endings. All right, hopefully you're all thinking free nerve endings. Okay, which substance enhances the sensitivity of pain receptors but does not directly, sorry, does not, not directly excite them? Um, so we've got bradykinin, serotonin, potassium ions and prostaglandins. Um, and as I said before, prostaglandins are the main ones um, for the um, increasing the sensitivity of pain receptors. Um, okay. With this one, um, so we have a boy who's cut his finger with a pocket knife and immediately applies pressure to the damaged area um, to alleviate his pain partially. So inhibition of the pain signals by this tactile stimulation of the skin is, me is mediated by which um, type of afferent neuron? Yeah, so that's B. Um, so that's basically just referring to the gate theory of pain. Um, and that's all that I have for you today. Um, does anyone have any questions? I had a question. Yeah, go for it. Um, I don't understand why people urinate when they're nervous if it's a parasympathetic response. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure either. <laughs> Maybe it's something to do um, with it being a reflex. Um, so as I said, it can just go to the spinal cord um, and maybe there's a lack of the um, conscious modulation. Um, but yeah, I'm not too sure about that, sorry. That makes sense, thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone for, for participating and um, I've got my email on the first slide, um, so don't hesitate at all to ask me any questions. Thank you guys.